think that is amazing. And what, what struck me when you said that is that I think a lot of people see boundaries as a negative, yes. especially people pleasers, because they don't want to not be liked. Uh, they want to make sure that everybody sees them as kind and generous. And so they tend to say yes to whoever asks them for something, right? Yes. So many of my clients are feeling a bit overwhelmed in the world right now, everything that's happening energetically, but also just in their jobs, there's less people to do more work as always. What would you tell to them in order to use boundaries in a better way for them to help maybe relieve some of that overwhelm? Mm. You know, again, because I'm always going back and looking at the deeper work, I think the number one place, Susan, well, there's a couple places we could actually start. The first is quite simple. And you kind of already touched on this. What are you believing to be true about boundaries? Mm -hmm. Because if you actually believe boundaries are selfish, boundaries are wrong, they're cruel, they're unkind, they're harsh, it's going to be a little extra work to kind of bring in some of those new beliefs. It's going to be hard to set a boundary when you actually in your subconscious mind believe that boundaries are wrong, selfish, sinful, cruel, harsh, mean, whatever right? So there's where we want to start going back a little bit into childhood and start looking at, and this is a longer answer than you're probably looking for, but for me, I always want to go back into childhood and start to help a client understand where that pattern was created out of or where that pattern was created from. Because so often there can be so much shame and criticism around, why can't I just set that boundary? What am I doing wrong? Why am I so X, Y, Z? And, and that's not helpful to shame, criticize, and judge ourselves. If that would have worked, it would have worked by now because most of us mm -hmm. are really, really good at that. So once we can go back and understand, oh, wow, wow, when I was at, and this is, this is a personal story that I use all the time in my teachings. When I was at that stranger's house that was supposed to, you know, babysit me for the day, my mom was going to a workshop and this stranger was going to watch all of us little girls that mo whose mothers were at this workshop. I was so excited because I was a friendly little girl and I liked people and I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to be able to make friends. I'm going to have new friends. And they weren't as excited to meet me and play with me as I was them. Mm -hmm. And so my mom went off to this workshop and they bullied me. They criticized me. They picked on me all day. And I remember sitting at that kitchen table feeling so lonely and so not enough and so not chosen and so worthless. Out of that, Susan, came my deep desire to be liked, to do anything it would take to just please people, to just be chosen, to just understand that I fit in and I belonged and to have someone see my value and my worth. So I would, I would abandon myself in order to have them accept me. And so when we can kind of go back and start to understand some of that, it's like, whoa, now we can bring in that beautiful self-compassion and, and really understand I'm not doing this because I'm, there's something wrong with me and I'm broken. I'm, I've been doing it all these decades, all these years to stay safe. Mm -hmm. It's a game changer for most people. So right. that's a little bit more of the deeper work that I would it really encourage some of your clients to take a peek at is where did some of these patterns get started? Because when we can start to piece those things together, it, it just lightens the load a little bit. Um, the other part is, is that, again, we have to really understand what we're believing to be true around boundaries. And we really have to understand what are requirements versus I think what are requests, right? Like, mm. So I think, and, and that's always a profound moment for people in terms of what is someone just simply requesting of me or what are they requiring of me? Are they actually requiring, are they actually requiring that I stay up till midnight and answer emails, <laughs> right? Yes. Or is this just something that I'm expecting from myself?
because mm-hmm. of trying to be that person. A lot of times perfectionism will go hand in hand with people pleasing, right? It's like, yeah. because underneath it, Susan, the belief is I don't want to look like a burden. I don't have any needs. So if I just have all of my T's crossed, all of my I's dotted, nobody will see that I have any needs. They'll just say, she's the hard worker. She's the one that's got it all. She's the one that, oh, wow, she is spinning so many plates. Good for her. I mean, society and culture love that, right? Yeah, because the the sad part about that is how much energy you are spending being someone else or hiding behind a mask or trying to be what everyone else wants you to be. And then you get home and you're exhausted and you just have no idea that, at least for me, I had no idea I was even doing that. Honestly, it didn't even occur to me that that was happening until later. And I realized no wonder you're exhausted when you get home, right? You're trying to be this person. And honestly, as I look back now, they were not asking me to be that person. I was creating that story. Yep. But it was really easy for me to fall into what others were doing and expect those things of myself. Yeah. So you also talked about um, expectations that we may place on other people. Yeah. And when they don't meet those expectations, we get frustrated. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what causes that? Why do we feel like we have to put those expectations on others? Mm, great question. Often that goes into the conversation a little bit around codependency, which I know can always, I, I don't love, I don't love labels. And I'm, I, I say, I'm, I always say I'm going to coin myself the art of the and coach because I'm constantly saying X, Y, Z and X, Y, Z and <laughs> because I often believe that two things can be true. So in my own journey and in my own growth, I I guess I would maybe call myself someone who had codependency or had codependent thought patterns. And <laughs> I don't often <laughs> love labels because people will wear that label on their forehead like, well, I'm codependent. It's just who I am. I'm a people right. pleaser. It's just who I am. And that's not, not what I'm saying. However, the label of codependency, once I started to go, whoa, I think I've got some codependent tendencies here. Then I was able to ask myself, where do I need to go to resource myself for help? How do I actually begin to heal this pattern? So I like to play with, I don't love labels, and they can be really helpful in your healing, you know, journey. Um, Mm -hmm. So this kind of ties in a little bit with, with codependency and what I often see with a lot of codependent, people pleaser type uh, patterning is that we have got so many expectations because we are filtering the world through how we see it, through our lens of the world. So I often, I like to bring a little levity into my work because sometimes this work (laughs) can be heavy. And so I always think to just laugh a little bit, right? Make it a little lighter. So I always like to say, if, if neighbor Sally had a baby, you know, here I am, bring in 35 casseroles over to Sally's doorstep, right? And every casserole's got the right bread, the right side dish, the right dessert. Obviously, I'm being a little extreme here, right? (laughs) Just to prove a point. And so then when the role, because that's how we filter the world, right? Like, oh my gosh, when, when somebody goes into the hospital, like this is just what you do to make that person feel loved and cared for and appreciated and whatever. And often, too, you know, as people pleasers and codependent type folks, uh, you can have some of those extreme sort of uh, untrue thinking patterns or almost like fantasy type ideas that and I really I mean, you know, I, I would in my own journey, I would take somebody a casserole when they had a baby and not know what I was going to feed my own family that night. And it's like (laughs) walking over, you know, kids that are having tantrums on the floor. And it's like, well, I don't know what we're eating, probably SpaghettiOs, but you know, at least they're going to eat good tonight. Right. But anyway, so when the role then is flipped again, we're often filtering the world through, well, I took Sally 35 casseroles. That's just what you do when somebody goes into the hospital. That's just, Na- that, that's just normal. That's just natural because that's how we're filtering and viewing things with that lens. So when we're in the hospital or something happens and people are not running in droves to deliver their 35 casseroles, 
were like, what is even happening? How could they? How dare they? And we're so disappointed. So oftentimes you will see that codependent, people-pleasing patterning us folks will often have a lot of disappointments in our life. So I always like to tell people, where are you disappointed in life? And they'll, and then once we start to kind of piece that together, it's like, whoa, I have got so many expectations because of how I'm filtering the world, because of how I'm viewing things that I'm just projecting onto mm-hmm. other people. And we don't know what Sally's got going on. Right? She might not have the capacity to bring us 35 casseroles. She's got her own wounding and traumas that she's perhaps dealing with. Or maybe she just doesn't want to. You know, Maybe Sally is somebody who has done the work and is practicing really good boundaries. But we see that as, oh my gosh, it's so disappointing because it's how we're filtering and viewing the world. 